You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Thor, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lisa Scottolini. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a fantastic show for you today. But before we get started, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors. Jeff Sweat and his new book, Mayfly. It's actually a duology that's out now. You can join in the Mayfly Quest at mayflybook.com. Start your journey. Long ago, a mysterious plague hit the city of L.A., decimating the population. Only children were immune. Ever since, no one lives past 17, and no one knows why. There are clues all over the city. Only the most determined will recognize them, and only the cleverest will be able to solve them. Life is short. Can you outlive it? Go to mayflybook.com to join the Mayfly Quest today. And thanks to our friend Ernie Lindsay uh, for sponsoring the show. His Sarah, the complete series, uh, is on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. In Sarah, the complete series, a peaceful but hectic life is shattered for a mother and her children, along with her friends and colleagues, by kidnapping, murder, and vengeance. Those seeking retribution will go to any lengths. This bargain price collection contains over 600 pages of thrilling suspense, which includes all three novels in the Sarah series and the companion novella. Sarah, the complete series by Ernie Lindsay. Now stay tuned for the show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Lisa Scottolini on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book called Someone Knows, uh, and this is an amazing story that I know you guys are really going to love. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Hank. I appreciate it. I'm excited to have you today. Uh, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, my, how interesting. Well, I've always loved books, but I must say that the first memory of it was when I was in a library. God bless libraries. And I was on my 85th Nancy Drew. (laughs) (laughs) I was a big Nancy Drew fan. And I thought to myself, I wonder if I can write one of these. And I think I was. I was probably in fifth grade at the time, which was crazy, but I just, now I didn't revisit that until college, that, that wish until I was actually at the University of Pennsylvania sitting in a classroom with Philip Roth. I took a seminar, a year long seminar with him just, and said to myself, you know what? You're never going to feel happy unless you give this a shot. So of course, having said that to myself, I went immediately to law school. <laughs> <laughs> As one does. But I had to make a living. I was a broke person. I had to pay back loans. But eventually I um, said to myself, you never give up on that dream. And then uh, after my first divorce, this is funny, but the truth is every, you know, you don't know what curves life's going to give you. And I said, you know what? You're broke again. So you can't get broker than broke, and you've got this beautiful little girl to raise, and you want to be home with her, so why don't you really try to write that book you've been wanting to try for so long? And I did. It took me five years to get published, but I did. Well, yeah, yeah, that's a a perfectly uh, uh, normal scenario that you just laid out there for us. Um, I always find it interesting that these... um, uh, these early memories, and the reason I ask that question is because I, I love to see how and when the the gift wakes up in in someone. I I feel like that that storytellers are born that way. That there's a, a gene or a gift or however you want to call it, and um you know for some people then decide to hone that craft and become a writer. Um, but there's just something innate that wants to to tell stories to people. Um, Nancy Drew aside, uh, were there any other big um, stories or series or um, genres that just really captured your imagination? Now, interestingly, I think to respond to what you said, too, I do think so many people have a story in them. I mean, I don't, yeah. you know what I mean? I think everyone does. Like when they go home at the end of the day, if they're lucky enough, I live alone. But if you live with somebody, they go, oh, how was your day, dear? You know, how'd the interview go? You're going to tell it. Yeah, so let think, me tell you. You know, I, <laughs> Right? Let me tell you. And I really love, I really want, you know, so I think your show like yours is so great because I really want to encourage people, 
you know, to, to pursue that and to really sit down and tell it and, and recognize that, um, it's not, uh, you know, like to be a lawyer, you have to go to law school and I know there's MFA programs, but you don't need to go to the one to, to, to write a novel and, and you're, and it's really something you really do learn by doing. I mean, someone knows this, I think my 31st or 32nd book and I hope I'm getting better. Um, you really just try to improve your craft. And every time I write without an outline, so I sit down and just hope the story starts. And this book had an incredible surprise ending. <laughs> it comes as a surprise to me. But so there's no there's no right way to do it. There's no wrong way to do it. Uh, God bless us. It's a free country. We still have a First Amendment intact. And you get to tell whatever story you want to tell. So I really do like to encourage people, as you're saying, you know, who knows when you're struck by whatever gifts you have or whatever energy you have. You know, so right. many people, I think, are born with a gift that they never use. Exactly. Uh, right? So I think it's really great to the, everyone recognize that they can do this and they should if they want to. Well, it's it's so weird that if you if you have a room with 100 people in it and you ask who in here believes they have a story in them, almost every hand would go up. Um, but then you take that same 100 people in, and you take – a you know, a, a tally of who actually started a book and that goes way, way down. And then for someone to actually finish it, there might be one or two people, um, left standing, you know, at the right. end. W- right. W- what do you think that is that, uh, I know that, what that is. Oh, I, tell I can me. tell you, I know what that is. It's a couple of things. And I can tell it because I often when I do speaking engagements, I, cause I want to encourage people and I always say, listen, here's my offer to you. And it's a big offer. I say, when you are finished your novel, write to me and I'll, uh, uh, with you, I will recommend you to my agent. Now that's a, honestly, that's a nice thing to do. I wish someone had done it for me. Yeah. No, I, I think I've been in 30 years. No one, I think I've been taken up on that maybe five times now. Okay. That's what, insane. What is going, but yeah. Right now, what is going wrong? I'll tell you what's going wrong. And it's not that people are lazy. It's that they're in their own way as I was, you know, you asked me, when did I first want to be a novel? No, I never ever, no one's ever asked me that question. That's really an insightful question. I had to think a minute, but I knew the answer because I can tell you I was on the library floor, floor and it was air conditioned. And so many ways the library was an oasis for me. And one of them was it had air conditioning because we didn't. So anyway, what I'm saying is what happens to people that they don't translate that? They think it's too hard. They think only certain people can do it. They they defeat themselves before they start. I'm not faulting them. That's I'm actually trying to do the opposite to say. Right. And they also, to a certain extent, that's why shows like yours are great because I want to demystify it. I'm just a lady who sits down every day and writes two thousand words. Now they don't have to write two thousand words. They could just write five hundred, even if they're working full time. Write a hundred. Pick a number and write it every day. Tell yourself the story that you're about to tell. You know, that will, if you write it every day, it, you, you become, even if you weren't disciplined before, it teaches you a discipline. And the other thing that happens is your, your little brain starts working on it, which I've only taught this to myself. I go, oh my God. So sometimes I'm sure that you've, you know, talked to plenty of writers and they'll say something like, I want, that for me, it happens in the shower. If I take a shower, I'll go, that's what should happen next. Because your brain works on the problem that you assign to it without you even knowing if, if we're lucky enough. And I do think that happens. And so, you know, I really want to say to people, yeah, just do that every day and try not to be in your own way about it. Don't judge it. I always say to myself, um, get it down, then get it good. Because if you were too worried about it being good before you get it down, you'll never get it down. You know, my, my last point is, look, I'm on my soapbox now, but <laughs> but I really do mean it. Um, Stephen Sondheim, the amazing, amazing um, playwright is the wrong term, but you know what I'm saying. He's yes. an incredible composer. And he's a genius. So he says uh, in Sunday in the Park with George, which is about the creative process, he says, stop worrying if your vision is new. Let others make that decision. They usually do. You keep moving on. Okay, I I have that in my office. I look at that. And I think that's what happens. I think people worry if their vision is new. They worry what people will say. They show it to somebody and the person goes, this sucks. What's the matter with you? And they fall victim to the negative voices in their own head and others. And they don't get to do what they want to do. And I want to help them if I can. 
Well, we've done more than 600 of these uh, author interviews, and uh, talking wow. to 600 different writers, there are a- as many different ways to uh, to hatch a story as there as there are writers. Um, I love that verb. That's great. <laughs> hatch a story. That's yeah. great. Um, when that first book that, uh, that when you had made the decision, okay, I'm going to seriously do this. You had, uh, you know, pursued, uh, law school and, and all of this, but you, you gave yourself the, um, the opportunity and the permission to, to, uh, to chase this dream that you always wanted to do. Um, what mm-hmm. was that first idea that came to you that became the book, uh, that launched your career? Well, it's interesting. I, I, really struggled. And I, I remember when I sent my first book that I wrote out to agents, uh, an agent wrote back to me, um, we don't have time to take any clients. And if we did, we wouldn't take you. Whoa. I know. <laughs> so mean. And you know, the great ending of the story is a couple of years ago, I saw him at book expo where I was the keynote speaker. Okay. He came up to me. He wanted to talk to me. You know what? I didn't have time to talk to him. Actually, I, <laughs> That's how petty I was. I was like, you know what? I am not going to make the time to talk to you, sir. Nobody has the right to be in anyone else's dreams. So the truth is my first story was never, my first novel was never published. Um, It went around. uh, It was, but some of the rejection letters were really good. And one of them said, you know, you really are talented. Keep at it. And that was so wonderful. Now the unfortunate kicker to the story is I lost that book. I don't know where it is. It was oh, no. in the olden days of I know, little, um, you know, little, what were they, those things that we put in slots in the computer card? The, like the, the, the three and a half inch yeah. diskettes. Yeah. 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 That, I have one on my desk on. right here. That's got a, a <laughs> novel that may never be hatched again. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost that disc and now that whole entire novel is gone. Oh, but, um, no. So I actually don't even, I know it was about a bad thing that happened to a person, but I said, you know what? I'm going to try again. So the the book that really launched me was um, Everywhere That Mary Went, which was nominated for an Edgar Award, unless you think this is a complete fairy story, lost. Um, but my second novel was nominated and won. But it was about just the, a, a woman who worked in a law firm, like I did at the time, and who um, kind of needed a date like I did then and now. And it was really about her life and kind of like solving a mystery. It's called Everywhere That Mary Went. And in a way, it was a lot like, it wasn't childish. I don't always like to say this, but it was, it was like Nancy Drew because the character, and I think a lot of my women characters have all the strengths, the strength and the independence that I see in the women around me, you know, we, and I like to celebrate that in books. So I have plenty of male main characters, but I also like to write, um, you know, a spirited character who is fighting the odds because I think we're kind of all that at some level or time in our life. Yeah, yeah for sure. Right? Uh, yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, that you don't write with an outline. And when you sit right. down, you, you hope that something happens. Um, when when you start coming up with a new story idea, um, what usually comes to you first? Is it a character? Is it a premise? Um, is it maybe a headline you saw in the news and then your imagination runs wild? How, how does the process usually start for you? Well, it's never a headline. It's always some idea. It's like someone knows is uh, one day I just said, well, the, the genesis was me looking back at my life, which I think I, I do. I'd love to try to examine what I do and when and stuff like that. And it was me going, how could I have done something so stupid? You know, like, and I thought, you know, a lot of po- people probably look back at their teenage years and go, well, how, how did I survive myself? You know, why did I do this dumb thing then? For me, I was looking back actually being married twice and divorced twice and going, what were you thinking? Like, what were you thinking? And so the idea came to me, teenage pranks, you know, the, and so someone knows is about a teenage prank that five teenagers engage in that goes horribly wrong. Um, I'm not giving anything away to say they they play Russian roulette. They think the gun is unloaded. The gun turns out to be not, turns out to be loaded. And tragically, someone dies. They all flee the scene, keeping the secret. Every one of the novels I've written, I've written 30 or so now, are about what is justice. And a lot of times, right? And so a lot of times in the past, I, we say, well, justice is punishment. You know, you send somebody to jail and that's kind of, you're supposed to feel that's Punishment and punishment equals justice. 
But as a lawyer and as a law professor, I can tell you that that's not really exactly true. So I said, well, Someone Knows, which is this book, is a book about what happens in the absence of justice uh, and in the absence of punishment. Because what happens is when this terrible event happens after the prank, no one gets punished. Like, they get away with it. And I wanted to explore what happens in their life later. Um, So in this book, it's told through all these characters' viewpoints, but particularly this one woman who is looking back and going, how could I have done something so stupid? I have been racked with guilt my whole entire life. She punishes herself more than the law would have ever punished her. And she's got to figure out who loaded that gun. And that's what she, or she will never be free. I mean, it's a little of that, it's an exploration of that, that saying no justice, no peace. You know, I'm interested in what, what are the relationships of these concepts to the human psyche? And that's well, what the, that someone knows is about. And the, and the flip side of that is that um, sometimes justice carried uh, too far and in the wrong spirit becomes vengeance. And that's a, uh, that, that is just as m- much a miscarriage of justice a lot of times as, uh, as, as no justice. And, and sometimes the right. vengeance is upon ourselves. Um, and it, it's a really interesting, um, kind of thought experiment that we get to run through in this book. Yeah, that's it. That's nice of you to say that's, and that's a really true analysis. Cause I do think, you think of popular fiction, the movie Taken. Justice is equated with revenge. Well, at least he's trying to save her. But later, there's a lot of revenge. There's tons of revenge movies. Well, what is the difference, right? I mean, what is the difference between revenge and justice? And we can, the great thing about novels, you can just take the time to explore, even if you're going to tell, you know, an exciting story. And I think I do. Um, what, what is that? What is really, what is, you want to shape the contours of this word that gets thrown around a lot and understand that there's a nuanced difference, as you point out, between revenge and justice and punishment. And, you know, I think people like to, uh, I sort of have never written a, a prologue before, but I did in this book, because I sort of said, listen, there's a character in the book who loves books, and he loves fiction. And I, you know, you know, I talk to a lot of book clubs, and happily, a lot of book clubs read me, and I sort of go, you know, we think we, what do we learn from fiction? Because we're pretty sure that we learn from nonfiction, because you learn actual facts. So, Oh, here's it, Hamilton, and this is when he was born, and he came from this, again, he came here, and blah, blah, blah. But really, you can learn from fiction as well. I mean, that's what Dostoevsky is trying to teach you in Crime and Punishment. What do you learn from Crime and Punishment? Well, you learn quite a lot. And so that's what I really was trying to explore is, you know, in an exciting and involving way. Well, the the uh, comparison to Dostoevsky um, and Crime and Punishment is uh, uh, is a... Uh, is a great uh, comparison. Um, did were you um, were you pulling from that well uh, as you wrote this? Were were you cognizant that this was going to have similar themes, or as the the book evolved, did you start making the connection? No, I mean, and and I don't want to even sound too lofty about it, but there's no no harm in reaching for the stars. I didn't sure. start there. Truly, you're right. I didn't start there. I started with the things I told you at the outset. And then as I started to explore it, I was like, well, you, you read this, like you've read this concept. What, what is your new take on this concept? How does it fit in a modern world? Like, for example, I think everything in a thriller, like, why is this, why is the novel page turner? It isn't because of like action sequences or dopey stuff like that. It really has to be because of, you're right. I mean, it has to be because it's a character you care about in a situation that's realistic and everything has to work for you. So for example, Someone knows the sentence of development. There's a reason for that, you know, because there's so much, you know, oh, you have adolescents developing in a development. And how is, I always like to look at the relationship of setting to character. You know, how is it, a lot of my books are set in Philly, where I'm from. What does it mean to be living in a development when the houses are all the same or in the ritzy section, they're bigger and they have a bigger lot or the houses are mirror images of each other? How, are the families mirror images? What are this difference? And, and you're sort of always exploring what is it, a fresh new take on the modern view of crime and punishment. Because we know now, unlike we did in crime and punishment days, that you know, what is criminal justice and what is civil justice, for that matter, uh, has changed a lot. And we don't have as rosy a view of our justice system as we used to. We're much more realistic about its impact on uh, people depending on their, their race 
their, um, their economic level, the geographic where they live. And so this book is trying to take all of that into an account at the same time that we're really looking at the dynamics of a family and how this traumatic event changes these people's lives and how do they, how are they affected by it as throughout later in their lives. You have, um, you've said before that you write entertaining books for smart people. Um, yeah. What do you, what is it about your stories that uh, do you see that strikes us on a level that makes us want, as readers want to, um, to stop a page every now and there, think through the implications of what's going on. Um, and is that ever, um, a danger as a writer that, that the subject matter is going to be so heavy that you break the, uh, the page turning aspect of a thriller? Right. And that's something you have to balance. I, I think that you, you try very hard. I don't, that I make sure that doesn't happen. And I'll tell you how, because, uh, I think it was Hemingway that said this great thing, which was write drunk, edit sober. (laughs) No, I don't do that. But I get the idea. So you're going to pour all that stuff out in the first draft. And then when you come to edit, you're going to strike all of it out again. As the great Elmore Leonard said, you know, he he leaves out the parts people skip. Uh, People aren't coming to me to have a lecture, an exegesis on crime and punishment except that they are in a secret way. So I'm going to still tell the story and the story is paramount. You know what, I, where I learned it? I happened to, was lucky enough to be on the Today Show and the person right before we go on the cameras, is, they're running around like nuts and they put makeup on your face and you sit there, you're kind of bewildered and dazed and someone comes up and starts flashing seven fingers. Like they hold up their hands and they say seven, they're saying seven. And I said, what are you, are you trying to tell me I have seven minutes or seven seconds? And she said, no, you have seven words. Answer the question in seven words. And I was like, wow, that's, you just blew my mind because as you can see, I'm speaking very fluidly to you. Uh, I don't do that. I'm Italian. We talk forever. So, so then ever since then, I said to myself, so when the, when the lights came on, they said, what's your book about? Now, obviously, it wasn't someone knows. But since then, I can say to myself, someone knows is about a teenage prank that goes horribly, tragically wrong. That's probably six words. And what I do at the beginning of every book is, I mean, you're interested in process. If you want to know, I'll tell you, I write those seven words on a sheet of a post-it and I put it on my computer. So the book isn't about crime. It isn't about punishment. It isn't about an idea. It's about a, a person who has to go back and figure out what happened with the teenage prank that went horribly wrong. And as soon as you that's always your North Star. You return to it constantly. It's a story about a person. I often think subject, verb. You know, uh, alley, cross the room. It's a person who does a thing. And as long as you do that all the time, you will be talking about action or thought and you will be telling the story and not some BSE tome that nobody wants to read. That is fantastic advice. It's worth the price is, of admission kind of right like there. Went off on you there, but I'm no, fascinated. I, to this. No, I love it. I love it. That is that's the best advice I've heard uh, all week. Um, Thank you. the 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 new book, someone knows, is uh, is narrated to us by a rotating cast of narrators. Um, what was that? Um, what was that decision like to uh, to start showing the the story from multiple viewpoints? And did that allow you, as the writer, to um, to play with us, the reader, a little bit more? Well, you know, that's kind of you to point that out and thoughtful of you. I, You know, structure, I've written in all different structures, and you just go with partly what your story demands. And I thought, well, really, you're writing about what is truth, what is justice. Everybody has a different view. And by the way, this prank is this horribly traumatic effect, which uh, event which affects everybody's perception in the time and their memory later. So well, as soon as you have that, you can't tell a story in a single point of view. That would, right? And I've certainly written books that way. It's like, oh, and I, I didn't used to. I'd be nervous. I would have been nervous in the past. I have all those insecurities that we talked about at the front end of the discussion. So, no, Lisa, don't be afraid. It's just you're telling a story in a single point of view, only you're telling a couple people's story. I, okay, calm down. Try to do it. What's going to happen? <laughs> so, you, that, that's, that's really what I had to do to tell this story. 
with more than 30 books uh, to your credit and more than 30 million copies sold, um, when you approach a new project and, uh, and, and we've talked kind of at length about this on the show with other people that writing out chapter one it, on a new project is, is kind of the, the great, um, uh, equalizer that, uh, no matter what you've done in the past, beginning a new one, everybody starts right back at the same spot with, with mm-hmm. no idea or a kernel of an idea. And, right. and the writing has to start all over again. Um, right. has it become easier for you? Um, is it, uh, do you, do you think about the process differently than you did in the beginning? You know, that's such an interesting question. I mean, I do, I, I, no, it's not easier. It is not easier. You would think it would be easier. <laughs> it's not. Um, and then, and in a way that's, I hope that's inspiring to your listeners because it's not like I sit down and, you know, smoke a cigarette. Well, I don't smoke, but writing will make you start smoking. You know, somebody else has a great expression. You know, it might be Hemingway as well. Which is, all you got to do to write is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. Like, <laughs> so you, so I sit down every time. I do believe in quotas because I think in the end, you know, you, your question touches on this. It has to be behavioral at a certain level. It's not academic, like get out of your own head. So I say to writers, you know, give yourself a quota, write 50 words a day. If you have a full-time job, that might be all the time you you have. My quote is 2000 words a day. I write 2000 words a day. Today I'm off because I'm, I'm talking and it's fun, but tomorrow I have to hit my mark. Now I have no idea how I'm going to do it. I'm not going to get up until I've done it. Um, some days I will get 2,000 words done by 5 o'clock. Oh, yay, I'm a genius. I get to have a nice dinner. Relax. Sometimes it doesn't happen until 9 o'clock and sometimes not till midnight. Um, you have to tell the story bit by bit. E.L. Doctorow has a wonderful quote, um, which I'm going to butcher right now. But the idea is this. You know, you may not know the whole journey when you drive across the country, but you can get there by your headlights. Right? Now, that is really a comforting notion to me. Because I don't know the whole journey. I don't know the ending. This book has an incredible surprise ending that came as a surprise to me. Amazingly, I think it worked. It's consistent with the characters. And, but I don't know it at the outset. And it's very daunting to start a project you don't know how to finish. But you can't figure, for me, I'm not constitutionally suited to figuring out at the outset. Plenty of writers are. I met half the writers I know, they have it all planned. The other half, I, and I admire all of them. I am not them. <laughs> the only good thing I say in my own excuse is that, um, you know, I do think that in my case, if I don't know what's going to happen next, the reader isn't going to feel that, the reader's going to feel my uh, nervousness and anxiety and interest and urgency, you know, because I think a lot of times I, I've read novels where I, where it seems like the character does something in chapter seven, for example. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder why they did that. I didn't think that was consistent. And then in page nine, let's say they drive to Atlantic City. And then in page nine, they find something in Atlantic City. And you're like, oh, well, you had them drive there to get the thing because you had an outline that said they have to get the thing. The only problem was, I don't know why the character was driving that that way. And I always think of, um, I happen to be in a movie this happened many years ago, but it's always ringing in my head, where the, someone in the back behind me said, that would never happen. This woman just said it right out loud. <laughs> I don't even remember. The, <laughs> right? I don't even remember the movie. I remember the woman. I remember the certainty of the statement. And when I sit there and I write, I have her little voice in my head. And I'm always like, don't get ahead of yourself to chapter nine. Now, if you're me, you can't. Because I don't know what's going to happen. I so right. I will make other mistakes, but I will not make the mistake of having the character do something stupid so I can get to nine because she has to find the buried treasure that I don't even know exists. If you can follow that, right? <laughs> exactly. But we all read the book we can. Yeah, that's all. It, if we only had the honesty as writers um, that that someone can give in a dark theater when they're not looking at the screen, right? If, if we could right. only have that honesty when we were writing, that would be amazing. Right, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lisa, I am. Uh, I regret that we are almost out of time. Um, I, I could talk with you all day, but the new book is "Someone Knows: 
Um, it's, uh, when people are hearing this, it goes on sale tomorrow, but you can pre-order, uh, get your pre-order in. Now it's, uh, available on hardback and, uh, Kindle and audiobook. Um, this is an amazing book. I'm sending everybody I know to go pick up a copy. Um, if people are just learning about you, God forbid, and want to dig in your back catalog and learn more about what's going on with you and your life, is there a place online where they can connect with you? For sure. They can go to my website, which is scottolini.com, S-C-O-T-T-O-L-I-N-E. And I'm on all social media. And it's me. I'm the person behind the Twitter and the Instagram and all that stuff and Facebook. So follow me and they'll learn all about everything. And also see my dogs, which are the most important part of me. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, Lisa, I'm a huge fan. Um, I, I love what you're doing. We're going to send everybody to see you and to pick up their copy of Someone Knows. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show Thanks today. Thanks so much for such a great talk. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Seven men ran the farce. The seven witch hunters. The court of Oyer and Terminer. They tortured and lied and mutilated and murdered. They knew those women up in Salem Village were no witches. Their true target was the coven hidden in their own midst here in Salem Town. They meant to hang the innocent until the sisters surrendered. Did they surrender? said Jason. No. Was that the wrong decision? To let innocent women die and save themselves? What do you think? Should the coven have fought openly? Created more hysteria by swooping in on broomsticks and casting spells over Salem? Should they have killed the judges? There are no right decisions. That is the horror of a witch hunt. Everything you do condemns you. Question the judge, thou art a defiant witch. Question his laws, you question the king, and thou art a treasonous witch. Question his superstitions, you question scripture, and thou art a blasphemous witch. Pity the condemned, you pity witches, and thy Christian mercy proves thy collusion with Satan. Witch hunters are not just bad lawyers practicing bad law. They are men who place the ends before the means. They choose their victim, a man, a woman, an entire race, and mark them for extinction. All evidence is damning evidence. All associations are damning associations. All infractions. And who among us is without sin? Are unforgivable infractions. Their own failings and abuses of power are shrugged away as mere vigor in pursuit of the public good. A witch hunter will have you by whatever means necessary. If he cannot find evidence, he will create evidence. He will entrap you and question you and distort what you say. He will walk you through the night until your feet bleed, strip you and stripe you, dress you in your own filth until you forget you are human. He will torture your friends until they betray you. And if anyone dares to weep at your hanging, he will drag them to Gallows Hill in the back of the next ox cart. Any man can be a witch hunter. All it takes is hatred and arrogance and the preening self-regard that proclaims my deeds are always good because they are my deeds. The seven judges of the Salem court were such men. But one witch stood up to them. She stood up to centuries of unchallenged murderous dogma and pronounced the magic word, no. They burned her for it. Flesh, Blood, Steel, the new book from David Allen Jones. 16-year-old Jake Harris wakes up after a horrific car accident to find 13 years have come and gone. He is 29 years old, a cyborg, and one of the world's most feared assassins. Horrified by the things he's done, things he can't remember, Jake vows never to kill again. Unfortunately, the company that owns Jake has other plans. They're not about to lose their top hit man to the errant memories of his teenage self. When Jake manages to escape them, they launch a worldwide manhunt that ranges from a near-future New York City to Paris. Desperate to remain himself, Jake joins a rebel faction dedicated to wresting control of the world's governments from the hands of militarized corporations. 
Using his enhanced body and perceptions, he is able to aid them in their fight. But Jake doesn't realize the rebels have their own plans for him, ones that involve unleashing his unique talents on their enemies. Faced with a dark past, he can't recall and uncertain whom he should trust. Jake must come to terms with the sinister choices that molded him into the man he became. Question is, can he avoid doing it all again? Assassins aren't born, they're programmed. Flesh, Blood, Steel by David Allen Jones. <laughs>